Okay, here we go. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Alberto Luis Lopez. Um, Alberto is a um, professor at the Universidad Autónoma, um, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, uh, UNAM. Um, and he has uh, been a friend of VAMP since the very beginning. He has uh, been one of the most um, vocal participants for which we all thank him. And, um, but he is also um, a great researcher. He has published extensively on um, Berkeley. Um, he has done some work on Leibniz. And uh, today he will be uh, taking us on a trip to the early understandings of um, colonial and post-colonial understandings of um, humanity through the works of Buffon, if I'm not wrong. Without further ado, you can have the floor, Alberto. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Manuel. Thank you for your generous presentation. And well, first of all, I want to, to thank the organizers for organizing this, this event, this seminar, which has been a very um, enriching and, and a place I know when we enjoy so much the time when we share twice a month. Um, and of course, well, thank you for accepting my paper. But, uh, you know, I want to say a few words before. First is uh, the, you know, regarding the title of my presentation. You got an email uh, from Emmanuel with different title. And the reason is because my presentation, my original idea was very, very long. It's about 24, yeah, 20, 22, no, 42, 43 pages. So or impossible to read in one session. So I decided to just uh, present here one part of my presentation, which is concerning to Buffon. The second part was on Cornelius de Pau, the Dutch, the Dutch born philosopher. So that's the reason I, I changed the, the title, uh, some, something uh, direct and precise, and in, in it's Buffon on America, that's all. And something else. Let me say that during my presentation, you will hear uh, America in singular. I know the, in the English speaking countries or English, the Anglophone atmosphere used to say America as in plural, but first, during the 18th century, the, the, the scholars, when they refer to America, they, they refer to a, a, a continent, a territory, a single one. And, and even now in the Spanish speaking world and even Portuguese, we said only America in singular. You know? And it's quite, a, it's, it's a little confusing when, when, when we hear like Americans and what is exactly America in plural. But well, so I will say America in singular and something else. I refer to Americans equals uh, indigenous Americans equals uh, Native Americans as a synonyms. Because again, during the 18th century, normally when, when most of the scholars refers to Americans, they were thinking in the original populations, not in Creoles, not in the Europeans migrated to Europe, basically in indigenous Americans. So that's the reason I said Americans, indigenous Americans or Native Americans. So um, having said that, let me share my presentation and their style reading. Um, now, well, as I said, uh, Buffon in America is a title for, for today. Let me start the, the PowerPoint, yeah. Here you can see only the, the, the contents, they're my original idea, but of course now I, I will focus just the introduction is one page, and the third part, Buffon, an enlightened and naturalist philosopher, and then the conclusions and critical comments are together, just, just to, to say in, in advance. So now let me uh, start reading. When current philosophers approach the concept of nature in the early modern philosophy, they usually do it from either an epistemological, theological, or historical scientific per perspective. And by doing so, they sometimes limited nature to physical nature. I mean, to an outward entity constituted by knowable laws. However, philosophers and naturalists from the 17th and 18th centuries thought of nature in a broader and more integral sense, as a system created or not by God as a part of a divine plan 
that had many ramifications in different orders, both external and internal. Due to this, nature, physical nature, ha had an impact, a direct impact on human beings as it configured and determined their nature. And the many 18th century intellectuals interest in America, two stand out, Jacques-Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon, and Cornelius de Pau, whom, from their study of the physical nature, posed a conception of human nature. The former argue in L'histoire naturelle générale et particulière, the thesis that American nature, including its animals, quadrupeds, and inhabitants, was weak and immature in comparison with that of Europe. The later constitute, continue this thesis in his Recherche philosophie sur l'Amérique, ou même moins intéressant pour servir à l'histoire de l'espèce humaine, or philosophical research, where he developed the so called degeneracy theory and applied it to the indigenous Americans. In the following lines, I want to analyze how both thinkers got from an external study of nature as a physical environment, an internal conception of it understood it as human nature. For both of them, nature determined human nature in all its facets, so that, according to their reasoning, the nature of the indigenous Americans and of the human beings in general was the result and consequence of their natural environment. So, well, as I said, Buffon, an enlightened naturalist philosopher, is a section I'm going to read now. Buffon, 1707-1788, was a French naturalist and a member of the French Academy of Sciences in Paris. His monumental work, Histoire Naturelle, was a collection of 36 volumes, plus seven volumes of a supplement, published between 1749 and 1788, to which eight more volumes were added posthumously. Within this work stand out Les Epoques de la Nature, or the Epochs of, the Epochs of Nature, which was published as the fifth volume of the supplement in 1778. His work, I mean, Buffon, his work was the first attempt to describe and classify in a systematic, secular way and in a single publication all the existing knowledge of the natural world, particularly in the fields of geology, natural history, history and anthropology that is from minerals, plants, and animals to humans. He developed an innovative and outstanding theory on, on the, of the earth, and although he shared the same empirical evidence as his peers, he was more philosophically ambitious, as he will say, as he will say in the introduction to this epoch. Buffon wanted to break up of the simple sequential earth narrative and create nothing less than a fully working and integrated model of the earth from giving, beginning through present to the end, where the Earth is categorically shown as one planet among other planets. In such a vision, and much of it was visionary, given the enormous gaps in the evidence base, everything must fit together with at least self-contained logic, and the story must be consistent with all the available facts. Interaction of planetary rock, atmosphere, ocean, topography, sea level, volcanoes, and life itself must interact in a way that made sense. To do what it is saying the above quote, Buffon started from the context in which Earth and consequently nature was conceived from a dynamic and historical perspective, and in which the assessment of the climate and living beings, including humans, was intermingled with a compilation of fables, anecdotes, and expedition of travelers, naturalists, and missionaries, that is, with secular and pseudo-scientific theories. This later fits with Gunnar's own statement that the 18th century groups of scientists live in a pre-establishment stage of science. However, this statement is contrary to what Hannah Roman asserts about Buffon, for she says that he brought a critical eye to the history to the histoire naturelle by judging and choosing between the sources of information, such that he says his essays did not act as an accumulation of all knowledge and opinions. In addition, she argues that Buffon believed in a process of discernment where the truth of the sources of information could be discovered by, valida by the validation of the server immersed in nature through the historical, temporal, and critical process of forming analogies with the natural world, says Roman. In this same sense, in the introduction to Les Epoques, it is said that Buffon, and I quote, was an avid reader and an effective correspondent, so his ideas include much of what others in his class saw across the rest of the known world. 
Despite what Roman says in her book and the authors of the introduction to this epoch in their introduction, if one focuses on Buffon's conception of human beings, in particular in indigenous Americans, it seems that Gunnarsson's statement is more precise because it is inexplicable, for instance, that Buffon did not give enough credit to the first chronicles of the Indies, despite they had first-hand information about American nature and its inhabitants. His relative indifference, I mean, in reference with regards to the chronicles, contrary to a scientific approach that tries to gain objective knowledge independently of one's judgment, was perhaps because either the Spanish chronicles never elaborate a systematized theory about American nature, or because they never affirmed the decadence of the continent, quite the contrary, or maybe simply for political reasons. In any event, by willingly deciding to whom to give credit, from whom to accept information, and to whom deny credibility, we found lost good and reliable information giving way to unnecessary distortions, misunderstanding, and confusions. This section is titled On American Nature. Buffon's project on natural history was based on three characterizations of nature. First, nature entails a historical development. Second, nature is something living, fluid, and changing. And third, nature is an open book that can be read, but to know it, we need to learn both its language and the way to reproduce it in our own writings. The first two considerations go together, since Buffon held that the earth had an origin and with it also nature. The idea of an origin allowed him to assume that a historical perspective of nature, which implied changes for better or for worse. And this idea gave rise to his thesis of an immature or degenerate nature according to its state of development. This crucial thesis was a consequence of the data available to Buffon but also of observations and comparison made on him. From all this information, he concluded that in the, in the origin, all the terrestrial part of the earth was united, but gradually it was separated into the current continents, mainly due to the subsidence of the lands by, as he says in his epoch, the collapse of caverns, earthquakes, and the actions of volcanoes, but also by the continual action of the general movement of the seas. With surprising, with surprising accuracy, we found holes in the same work that it is at the day of around 10,000 years in the past, counting from today, that I would place the separation of Earth from America. And it is about the same time that England was separated from France, Ireland from England, Sicily from Italy, Sardinia from Corsica, and both from the continent of Africa. After the separation of America and Europe, which took place due to the subsidence of the lands that formerly formed Atlantis, and then that of America and Asia, proof of the subsidence in the northern seas of the East, and after the consequent rupture of the Straits, the water ceased to invade the great spaces, and subsequently, the land gave ground from the sea. According to Buffon, America was the last continent to be separated and the last to emerge from the waters, which led him to consider it as a new land. When one reflects on these marked differences between the old and the new world, one would be tempted to believe that the later is indeed much newer and, it has, and that it has remained longer than the rest of the globe under the waters of the sea, says Buffon. To prove his thesis, he resorted to, to paleontology since he received information about the existence of fossil shells proper of the, of the seas in the high mountains of the supposed new land. One, one finds there, indeed, in several places, under the first layer of the vegetable ground, the shells and the mud reports of the sea, already forming banks, masses of limestone, but usually less hard and less compact than our stone of size, of size which are of the same nature. After many years of changes, Asia was the first continent in being, in being inhabited by animals, whereas America the last one. In the third epoch, he says, thus, since the origin and at the beginning of a living nature, the highest land of the globe and the, and the parts of our north were the first populated by the species of terrestrial animals best suited to great heat. The regions of the equator remain long as deserts, arid and without seas. The highlands of Siberia, of Tartary, and other parts of Asia, all those of Europe that form the chain of mountains, 
and Galicia, of Galicia, of the Pyrenees, of Arne, the Alps, of the Apennines, of Sicily, of Greece, or Macedonia, were the first inhabited countries, even over a number of centuries. Now, let's move on to the third consideration, nature as a legible book. For Buffon, the way we express nature was almost as important as nature itself. But one of the problems he faced with respect to American nature was precisely how to name its flora and fauna, taking into account that for him and his European colleagues, American nature was almost unknown. This problem is good, was Gunnarsson underlies by saying that naming and terminology were an important aspect of science at this time. Scientists were discovering new species and describing new relationships, for which it was necessary to devise names that fitted into a system. Naming, in other words, proceed in parallel with discovery and classification. Encyclopedias and dictionaries served to standardize these processes, which of course also attracted debate and criticism. Buffon made use of the experimental research method known as comparative method, which analyzes and compares different species, cultures, age groups, or behaviors, so as to identify similarities and dissimilarities and obtain an understanding of the object of study. For him, that method was the most effective to understand the unknown nature in order to name it and classify it. We know that one of his problems was the lack of correct names and terminology. Indeed, he himself built a good deal of a conceptual framework. And that explains some or many of his mistakes and problems in dealing with American nature. Thus, he made constant use of analogies and comparisons between the old and the new world. And after his comparisons concluded that the animal species of the old world differ from those of America. In consonance with his theory of Earth development, that difference was always to the detriment of America, since its nature, after being compared, was invariably inferior and weaker. However, despite being this to some extent coherent with his theory, it is hard to explain why he always conceived American animals in negative terms. This is the case when he described the American puma as a lion, asserting that the animal of, the, of America that the Europeans have called lion and that the Peruvians natives called puma has no mane. It is also much smaller, weaker, and more cowardly than the real lion, says Buffon. The same case applies to tapirs when they were compared to elephants. What a difference between the elephant and the tapir, says Buffon. And the same logic was used when he harshly criticized in comparison to the old world, the lack of some animals such as rhinoceroses, hippopotamuses, camels, dromedaries, and giraffe. There are no real monkeys in America, says bitterly Buffon. In sum, for the French naturalists, the species of quadrupeds were much less numerous in the new world than, the, than in the old, counting less than 70 in the former and 130 in the later. Also, the New World had a more limited selection of species, and they were generally more puny, slothful, and feeble. All this gave rise to Buffon's unavoidable conclusion about American nature. Living nature is thus much less active there, much less varied, and we may even say less strong, says Buffon. The reason for this can be explained in Buffon's terms, because the New World was a humid place. One of the causes was the cooling of the east wind, which he considered typical of the tropics. For him, although in places like Guinea or Senegal, this wind was warm after having crossed the hot sands of Africa and Asia, it cooled before reaching America due to the vast expanse of water it had to cross. Besides the fact that the clouds intercepted heat, sunlight, and the amount of rainfall. In addition, the Andes mountain and mountains change in general in America, being oriented from south to north, stopped the east wind, which caused the vapors in the air to condense and in turn produce, he says, an infinite quantity of living sources, which by the reunion from the greater river of the earth, the amount of water and rivers together with the perspiration of so many plants press the ones against the other, plus the lack of human transformation action, produce humid and unhealthy exhalations, which favor the development of insects and reptiles instead of quadrupeds. Thanks, Buffon. After analyzing plants and animal species, Buffon built 
with human beings. For it, he assumed the premise, the premise consequence of the historical and almost a determinist development of the earth that Asia was the first territory to be populated by humans and America the last one, in part because emerged later, as we already mentioned. He himself explained that America was inhabited by Asians who, following the same route as the elephants, crossed from one continent to another through North America. But what were the implications for the, for the inhabitant of America of the way the air was developed? This section is entitled Human Nature in American Soil. Once the earth took its current form and appeared all the animal species, Buffon analyzed the varieties of human beings. Along, uh, as humans were part of a natural world, he believed and took for granted, along with Hume, Montesquieu, and others, that climate and geography, among other circumstances, affected the temperaments, manners, and customs of people. As we have already seen, Buffon held that America was a new land and therefore was in a more natural, pure state than the rest of the globe. This fact caused that its climate was not benign and its geography not so suitable for development, which resulted in the consequence that its animals, particularly quadrupeds, were weak and immature in comparison with those of Europe. But what about humans? To answer these questions, I will focus mainly on his essay, Varieties of the Varieties of Human Species, Varieté dans l'espèce humaine, contained in the third volume of this one. His essay, a true bestseller exemplifies his intrigue to understand the mysteries of life. Since the first chapter is a philosophical discussion about human nature, in whose lines echoes of authors such as Descartes, Locke, Newton, Berkeley, and Condillac can be heard. The aim of his essay is to give an overview of the physical appearance, manners, habits, and sexual mores of the people around the world with the purpose of revealing how the material basis of human existence stems from, as it is based on, the interrelationship between geography and climate. Buffon's anthropological approach took place within the framework of the 18th century debates about the origin of human species. As we know, in that debate, some authors theorized that it was a single origin. We said, we call it monogenism in concordance, in concordance with the book of Genesis. Meantime, others held that there were several origins or different roots, polygenism. Buffon, contrary to scholars like La Perret, Fan de Mille, or Voltaire, supported the first stance, namely the idea of a single origin. For him, this thesis was correct, but not for theological reasons, but because it was the only way to judge all humans under the same model. Keeping this context in mind, as someone who wanted to have an explanatory theory of the world, Buffon analyzed men and women from all over the planet, beginning with Northern Europeans and finishing with the Americans. Concerning the later, when the French naturalists analyzed the indigenous Americans assumed two assumptions. They came from Asia, Tartary specifically, and second, America was a recently formed new land. A first consequence of the assumption of communal humans from the same origin, North Asia, was their physical resemblance. It is surprising, however, the manner in which Buffon described their, that resemblance, because despite he himself recognized that in Asia, grew sophisticated and cold peoples that transmitted knowledge and culture to important civilizations of the old world, such as Brahmins, Persians, Egyptians, or Greeks, or Greeks he described the physical characteristic of Americans and by extension those, those of Asia, Asians in negative terms. They were ugly, weak, and sexually indolent. With regards to their physical appearance, he pointed out the following. The savages of Hudson Bay and the north of Labrador do not seem to be as the same race as the former, if you think in, in Laplanders. Although they are small, ugly, and unshapely, their visage is almost covered with hair like the savages of Yeso, northern, northern of Japan. The savages of Newfoundland resemble those of Davis' Straits. Straits, they are low in stature, have little or no beard, broad and flat faces. 
large eyes and flat nose. A traveler says they are also far from being unlike the savages in the environs of Greenland. Do they resemble of oriental tartars in color, form and features, as well as in disposition and manners? That if they were not separated by an immense sea, we should conclude that they are descended from that nation. In point of latitude, their situation is almost the same. And this, and this further proves the influence of the climate, not only on the color, but the figure of men. It was clear for Buffon that the so-called savages of Canada and North America resembled the, the Tartars in so many respects that there was no doubt of their same origin. Another consequence of the assumption of a single origin was that when people from Asia crossed to North America, they populated slowly and with difficulty a new land, more in some northern parts and much less in the southern part of the continent. This consequence is related to the second assumption, America as a new land, because if America was a new land populated by Asians, then it was explainable the small number of men found in it. However, the, the tricky issue arises when, according to Buffon's anthropological theory, the individual only becomes civilized in society. From this premise, he assumed, following his discoveries about the new continent, that the small number of people and the small communities found in America showed that there were no real societies, and therefore that Americans were not civilized people. The multiplication of human species depends more on society than nature, says Buffon. Men would not have been comparatively so numerous as wild beasts if they had not associated together and given aid and support to each other. In North America, the bison is perhaps more frequently to be seen than a man. But though society may be one great cause of population, yet it is the increased number of men that necessarily produces unity. It is to be presumed, therefore, that the one of civilization in America was owing to the small number of inhabitants. For though each nation might have manners and customs peculiar to itself, though some might, might, some might be more fierce, cruel, courageous, or dastardly than others, they yet were all equally stupid, ignorant, unacquainted with the arts and destitute of industry, says Buffon. For him, the main reason of their lack of civility, I mean Americans, for not living in society was the fact that they had not dominated nature, a sine qua non condition for becoming civilized. Americans, by living in large extension of land that allowed them to enjoy fruits, fishes, vegetables, etc., as, as he said, without much effort, had not had them the necessity of becoming more numerous, of dividing up the land between them, of exploring nature, and much less of dominating it. But among, among, but among all those where space is confined by water or restricted by high mountains, these small nations become, become more numerous or are forced to divide up the land between them. And it is from this moment that the earth became the domain of man. He took possession by his word of cultivation and attachment to a fatherland very quickly followed this first act of possession, individual interest being part of national interest, order, police, and laws soon followed, and society assumed its solidity and its force. For Buffon, the knowledge of the actions and operations of nature is acquired only after the establishment of well-organized societies. And given that Americans neither live nor have ever lived in them, they still live in the ignorance of savagery. If they, instead of having been passive, would have been would have understand of their, understood and learned the lessons of nature and profited from its examples to their own benefit. In other words, if they had been active, intelligent, and reflective, they would have subjugated and tamed the animals. But not all, not only this. They could have drained the swamps, contained the rivers, cleared the forests, and cultivated the land, counted the time, recognized, calculated, and represented the celestial movements, compared the heavens and earth, and, respectful, and respectfully adored the creator, says Buffon in Les Epoques. But following the comparative method, according to him, 
none of, none of this happened in America. He says, compare in effect brute nature with nature cultivated. Compare the small wild nations of America with our great civilized peoples. See at the same time the state of the lands that these nations live in. You will easily determine the small world of these men by the slight impression that their hands have made it on the soil. Either stupid or lazy, these have brute men, these unpolite nations, large or small, only weigh down the glove without comforting the earth, starve it without nourishing it, destroy it without building, using all and renewing nothing, says Buffon. However, the uncivilized and savage peoples from America were so, not only because they were few in number, nor because they live in small communities, nor because they did not dominate nature, but also, and as a consequence of all this, because they lack culture. According to Buffon, an example of this, which has to do with their intellectual underdeveloped, was their lack of a true language. And I quote Buffon. As they had but few ideas, their expressions turn upon things, the most general and objects the, common, the most common. And though the majority of their expressions were different, yet the smallness of their number renders them easily understood. And more easily, therefore, may a savage learn and speak the, language, the languages of all other savage than it is for a man of one polite nation to learn the language of any other nation equally polite. After stating that indigenous Americans had suffered in the development of their, of their capacities due to the American nature, Buffon tried to explain why they were, they were physically different and in particular, why they had different skin color. He argued that although North American savages resembled the Tartars because they were situated, situated in the same latitude, yet Mexicans and Peruvians, though they live like blacks Black Africans under the torrid sun have no resemblance to them at all. This notorious difference led him to ask, whence then shall we trace the origin of these people? And whence proceeds the cause of the difference of color in the human species, since the influence of climate is in this case entirely overthrown? Buffon's first question had been solved. They came from Asia. But for the second one, the French naturalist gave an interesting answer. For him, following La Condamine thesis posed in his Relation à Verger, the reason for the different colors between humans was not nature, not climate in general, but in particular, the different temperature of the air. The air, which influenced the temperature and varied notoriously from the extreme heat of the torrid sun to the intense cold caused by the proximity of snow, caused in humans to change their color. Thus, according to his notes, the air in the torrid zone, that is between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, was usually hot or very hot, and the people who lived there were black or very dark. Meanwhile, in the temperate zone, the air was usually from mild to cold, and the people who lived there were white, or wider. In America, there were no black people. Firstly, because the torrid air coming from Africa was refreshed by, by crossing the ocean. Secondly, because it had cordilleras that blocked the calid air. Thirdly, because their altitude produced mountains covered by snow. All this tempered and refreshed the air in many parts of the continent, which explained why there were only brown and even, according to him, white people, but not blacks. And the same reasoning was applied to understand the greater or lesser degree of blackness in Africa, which depend upon the heat of the climate, according to Buffon. Buffon aimed to give an, a naturalist explanation of the skin color in humans by means of feasible data and reports collected by scholars and travelers. But when he faced with albinism, that is, people with little or no production of the pigment melanin and who are born white, even if their relatives are not, although surprisingly never the other way around, he considered it a proof of something deeper. 
albinism then was a finding that led him to a disturbing conclusion. White then appears to be the primitive color, color of nature, which climate, food and manners alter and even change into yellow, brown or black, and which in certain circumstances reappears though by no means equal to its original whiteness on account of its corruption from the causes here mentioned. Nature, as perfect as it can be, has made men white, and nature, altered as much as possible, still makes them white. But the natural white or white of the, or, or white of the species is widely different from individual or accidental white, says Buffon. Once Buffon developed his nature of earth and put forward with scientific conviction that nature, climate, temperature, and air was determinant for humans, and as a consequence of this, he postulated the primacy of white as the original color of nature, including the skin color of humans, he deduced a very important consequence. The most temperate climate is between the degrees of 40 and 50. In this zone are to be found the most beautiful and best formed people. It is under this climate that we have to take the idea of the true natural color of man. From there, we should take the model or the unity to which we must refer all the other nuances of color or beauty. The two extremes are equally distant from the true and the beautiful. Situated under this zone, the, the civilized countries are Georgia, Circassia, Ukraine, Turkey in Europe, Hungary, South Germany, Italy, Switzerland, France, and the north of Spain. All these peoples are also the most beautiful and the most and the best form in the world, says Buffon. For Buffon, natural nature itself is not only have is uh, nature itself not only had a clearly indicated original color that experimental research was able to show white, but it also provides this aesthetic distinction between beauty and ugliness. Following this reasoning, the majority of the indigenous Americans, whether because they, li they live in the torrid zone or, or were affected by that, that air, even those who live in the template zone, or whether because they came from Tartars, were for, for Buffon, savage, barbaric, unintelligent, and ugly. And this was so because according to him, different climates, nourishment, and way of living gave rise to different types of humans. These three factors were crucial for having good or bad food, and therefore good or bad manners, for being industrious or indolent, and even beautiful with a well-formed body or ugly with a poorly formed one. Climate and food thus influence the form of animals in such a way that the, their effects cannot be doubted. And although they are less rapid, less apparent, and less sensitive upon men, yet we must conclude from analogy that these effects take place in the human species and that they are manifested in the varieties found therein. Everything concurs, therefore, in proving that the human race is not composed of species that are essentially different from each other. On the contrary, there was original only one species of men, which after being multiplied and spread over the, over the entire surface of the earth, has undergone different changes from the influence of the climate, food, mode of living, epidemical distempers, and the infinite mi intermixture of individuals more or less resembling each other. As a result of all the above said regarding climate and its influence of American nature, I will quote a passage from Buffon as a conclusion of his stand about the indigenous Americans, in which he applied his theory about how external conditions affected internally human beings, that is, their way of being, of thinking, and of developing. All the American, all the Native Americans were or still are savage or almost savage. The Mexicans and the Peruvians were so newly civilized that they should not be an exception. Wherever then may have been their origin, it was common to them all. Sprung from one stock, they have retained with little variation the characteristic of their race, and this because they have pursued the same course of life. 
that the Americans are a new people seems indisputable. When we reflect on the smallness of their number, their ignorance, and the little progress the most civilized among them have made in the arts. In the first accounts of the discovery and co conquest of America, it is true Mexico, Peru, and San Domingo are mentioned as very populous countries. And we are told that the Spaniards have everywhere to engage with vast armies. Yet, it is evident this, that these facts are greatly exaggerated. First, from the paucity of monuments left of the pretend grandeur of these nations. Secondly, from the nature of the country itself, which though populated not doubt by Europeans more industrious than its natives, is still wild, uncultivated, covered with wood and little more than a group of inaccessible and uninhabitable mountains. Buffon's picture of degenerate and savage animals and humans was very influential and produced great admiration among many, many thinkers. Among them stand out Cornelius de Pau, his most radical disciple and who took the Buffonian thesis to their ultimate consequences. As I said uh, at the beginning, I'm, I'm not, I'm gonna skip the, the part of Cornelius de Pau because of the time. So let me just conclude. So this part is conclusions and critical comments. For a long time, it was believed that climate was an order principle that established an initial set of circumstances, circumstances that conditioned the human beings. But the relationship of the later with these circumstances was not fixed, but changed as human themselves, and the society which they necessarily form apart, developed and perfected. The intellectuals of the second half of the 18th century accepted this thesis and by doing so, admire the capacity of humans to dominate nature and mold it to their benefit, making climate a secondary factor. Buffon agreed with this idea by assuring that nature, and I repeat, climate, weather, air specifically, and food, condition human beings, that is, external elements determine the internal development of humans. From this assumption, he considered that Americans have been unable to alter their environment, partly because they were new people living in a new land, and modify it in their favor, which implied that they had been absorbed by a cold and humid nature. America was then a wild land because its population had not dominated. This conception resulted in Buffon's understanding and description of the indigenous Americans in terms of being savages and physically and intellectually degenerated which explain their physical appearance, their weakness, their sexual impotence, their small quantity, and in some, their underdevelopment. His thesis exerted a determining influence in many fields of knowledge in the second half of the 18th century and during the 19th century. His description of the varieties of human beings propagated a distorted idea about the indigenous Americans that was repeatedly mentioned and quoted both in Europe and in America. From, from another standpoint, Buffon and the Pau, I include, in, including the, I, I include the Pau. Buffon and the Pau stand out for the mixture of archaism and modernity. On one side, their scientific and philosophical works contain many traditional ideas, such as the predeterminism of, of nature, a Eurocentric point of view, and an assimilationist vision. On the other side, they conducted a methodological review of what had been said before and aspired to produce erudite works full of notes and data that would shed new light on knowledge. But at the same time, their works contain many mistakes due to the fanciful imagination of the trial literature, national, political, and economic interest, irrational prejudices, and even an inexplicable feeling of superiority. All those elements come together in their works. Maybe that explains why both thinkers, although refer to and even quote the 16th century writers, those who had direct contact with the new world, they did not take their information seriously, or when they did it, was in a biased way. In relation to this, call attention that in contrast to the first catalog of the American flora and fauna contained in Fernandez de Oviedo, Historia General de las Indias, General History of the Indies, who expressed sincere, sincere admiration for the variety of American nature, as also did Bernardino de Sagún, Toribio de Benavente, or Acosta, 
Many of the 18th century naturalists, philosophers, and intellectuals who mostly never traveled to America and wrote it from third part comments developed theories about the maturity of the continent and the inferiority of their species. This was the case of Buffon and the Pau, who never visited America, but surprisingly described the continent as a wilderness place with untamed nature. From it, both inferred and indigenous Americans were the result of the place they live. Related to this, it is astonishing, for instance, that Buffon and the Pau were unaware especially because both quote Bernardino de Sagún, that Nahuatl, the Aztec language, was such a complex language that had philosophical concepts such as think, clamantly, essence, gelistly, goodness, quietly, true, neltilistly, reflection, time, soul, mind, reason, thought, virtue, person, humanity, etc. And that clamatinime literally is those who know something and Tlatoque, literally those who speak or those who rule, use them, this concept, before the arrivals of Europeans to discuss metaphysical, religious, and existential topics. Equally surprising is that the fact that they didn't know that the Aztec had a complex numeral system with which they could calculate any number because they had the numbers 1, 10, 20, 100, 400, 8,000, etc. For some scholars, the lack of, this lack of information could be just, justifiable, but it is not when they themselves cite the works of those who transmitted that information for the posterity. Why then, despite the information they had at their disposal, continue stating the inferiority of the Native Americans? Why, if we found recognized that Mexicans and Peruvians were Polish and industrial people subjected to laws who live in towns with civil governments, and who were acquainted with the arts and not destitute of religion, at the end of his essay, conclude inexplicably and in contradiction with his, with his own description that all the indigenous Americans, including Mexicans and Peruvians, were savages, which is, this is relevant because we if we consider that by describing them in those terms, he assumed that their physical and mental capacities were underdeveloped. Why then he tried to establish a general concept of nature and observe that nature in America was different from that of the old world, deduced from the diversity, the inferiority of the new continent. Both authors contributed to diffuse a racial prejudice about indigenous Americans and to consolidate a determinist idea about them, which helped to reaffirm a stereotype highly prejudicial for the readers of the 18th century and later ages. This was the case, for instance, of many Creoles in Spanish America who received these ideas and were inflation by them to reaffirm their beliefs in, the, in their superiority face the inferiority of the indigenous. By being considered savages, inferiors, and even degenerated humans, the Native Americans became a burden, a problem for progress and civilization. From then on, it was necessary, as it happened in all the territories of Spanish America, to erase all traces of them. Herodic wars like that of Buffon and the Pau foster, even in un unintentionally, the necessity of whiteness, the idea of whitening the American population stained with the indigenous color, attitude, and morals. Unfortunately, viewpoints like these are still present nowadays. I conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alberto. Uh, this was very, very interesting. Um, so as uh, per our custom, I'll, uh, I'll ask uh, those of you who are comfortable with it uh, to turn on your cameras so that we can partake of uh, a virtual form of uh, socializing while we're uh, running the Q&A. Um, I see that we have already started with Jason raising his hand. Um, as a reminder, you feel free to um, either post in the chat or um, raise your hand virtually, and I'll try to keep um, brief or straightforward cue. All right, Jason. Uh, thanks so much, Manuel. Thanks so much, uh, Alberto. Uh, 
Buffon is someone who just comes up all the time and whom uh, I feel that we, we don't really actually look at. But for me, some, someone, especially looking at the 18th century, 19th century, yeah, you see him referenced by Hegel, by Schopenhauer, by everyone, right? So um, what's really going on in these texts, uh, I certainly didn't know. And so, so it's very informative. I appreciate that uh, outline of, of several major issues with this particular focus that you had. I'm wondering about uh, maybe two things, kind of, kind of big questions. So forgive me and, and maybe just take one of them if, if you like. Uh, uh, first, the notion of uh, naturalist that he's working with or naturalism that, that you're working with. I sometimes like to define naturalism as the view that there's nothing but nature. And it seems like he has this pretty um, broad notion of nature, according to which it's going to include the planets and the climate and so on. Uh, but does it also include humanity? Because on several occasions, you spoke of mastering nature. Are we mastering uh, ourselves insofar as we are mastering nature? Is there some kind of self-mastery at stake in uh, mastering nature? Or, or like, what's our position in nature, especially given the kind of unity that he sees apparently among human beings? Uh, right, descending from this uh, supposedly initially white race. Um, yeah, I'm wondering how this one race, if I understand correctly, of humans then relates to nature or to the rest of nature. And then I, I would wonder just about implications you think this kind of thinking has for today. Uh, or what kind of significance this kind of today will master nature uh, given climate crisis? One response is, you know, to, to further master nature instead of uh, trying to uh, uh, disentangle or, or um, exploit to a lesser degree. Uh, it seems like this is anticipating the kind of view according to which, yeah, we would we would uh, develop technology further to master than climate crisis itself or so, something like this. I mean, I'm seeing uh, anticipations in, in Buffon there. I wonder if you feel like this kind of thinking in terms of uh, mastering the climate persists today, just like you also see some persistence in the notion of race that uh, or some of the other related notions of ethnicity and so on that, that Buffon is, is working out. So those are, those are the two both kind of big things, like I said. Okay, just uh, in some moments, I don't know, you were frozen. I, uh, I noticed that might be happening. Sorry about that. Ah, okay, no, 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 no. But, but, was, but was it my, my internet could be or yours? Or both, be, yeah, no, uh, just as, uh, as the part that I understand you said you were thinking in, in the, the, the relationship between nature and how he reached the idea of, of white so, from a naturalist perspective. Because you know, in some for, for a few minutes, I lost your, your, your intervention. I'm, I'm very sorry, my probably my, my internet was un unstable, so I. I lost like the half of your your comment I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry for that oh no <laughs> no i think it's my fault i think it's my fault my question at that initial point was yeah are humans themselves nature or natural insofar as they master then the climate and other aspects of nature are are they nature mastering nature or, or, or is the picture such that like humans are are distinct uh, um, in their relation to nature as apparently a single race, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it seems like well, nature is pretty extensive notion for him. But how extensive is it? Yeah. 
Well, it, it is interesting because, for instance, in, in, in his work, uh, Les Epoques de la Nature, mm -hmm. he follow the epoch is divided in, in seven epochs. You know? And to some extent, he was, it seems that he was following this idea of, of the biblical idea, but at the same time, he, he denied. The problem was the theologians in the Sorbonne in that time. No, they, they are focused on, on his work, so he was struggling you know, with this idea. But what I, my idea is that um, I, I do believe he was not uh, thinking in, in theological idea or perspective. That's the reason he he tried to explain from the, from the beginning the origin of the of the earth from from a non theological perspective. Which is really, I mean, it's really interesting. It's very, very interesting. And then he, he, the last point was human natures, and human nature was the, the seventh epoch. You know? It is when mm -hmm. when humans begin and they start, and, and they they become part of a nature. So I believe that that humans are part of a process, you know, of, of a natural process. This is very interesting mm -hmm. because for him, yeah. everything is connected. You know? And everything is the consequence of, of, of the, the stage before. So it's like a chain, perfectly a, a, a chain that every step is consequence of the next step. So humans are necessarily appearing in some moment of history. You know? was, was, I, I would say it was impossible that they, they didn't appear. So they belong to nature. They were part of nature. But, but this is like my idea of some probably theological background that he said, okay, they belong to nature, they are part of them, but they must dominate it. You know? mm -hmm. and, and, and this is this is the main point with the Americans. You know? and, and when he's comparing all the time Americans with Europeans, this okay, human beings are part of nature, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. They are the consequence of all a, of a historical process, that's no doubt, but they must dominate nature because a, they have some the spirit and mind, no? spirit, mind. He, he he used to say in the first part of the of the varieties of human species, is a is a philosophical disquisition, and he is uh, taking uh, taking up ideas of Descartes and Condillac and Locke and many philosophers, considering that there is matter and soul. No? Mm. So this is the this is the, the very important distinction in, in human beings. They have mind, understanding, soul. And this is this is a very particularly as it's a peculiarity in them that the rest of, of living beings they don't have. So that's the reason that he understands that humans must dominate nature and on animals and everything on earth, but always considering that they are part of nature. That they are a produce of nature. They are the seven time of the of the, you know, the seven epoch of the nature, just a consequence, just a result of a of uh, sequential of the time. He, he for, for, for instance, he has two different calculations. In the publishing work, the published work, he, he was considering like 20,000 million of years, uh, 30,000 million years and so on. But at the end of his life, in some of his correspondence, he said that, well, I disagree with this calculation, but I never, uh, I, I never dared to, you know, to say my, my real opinion, because I believe that, that my colleagues will didn't understand when I, if I talk about million of million of years. So he tried to, to share the time. And of course was at the end of, the, of his life, he, he, he recognized that it was impossible that in, in 4,000 years, something, something like he was describing happened and so on. But uh, what I say with this is, is that he, he understand uh, all the process, all the natural process as a historical and very, very long process that finishing with human beings. Yeah, is what I, what I could say now. Thank you, thank you. That's, that's super helpful. That I might, I'll, I'll wait to ask you anything else. Let's uh, uh, see, see it is question first. Okay, can yeah. I... Yeah, I'd like to follow up in one sense in terms of uh, two figures that seem to me missing there in some very interesting ways in terms of nature are Aristotle on the one hand and Spinoza on the other. Uh, for whom, first of all, for Aristotle, there's definitely a continuity between the animal soul. In other words, animals have soul. 
okay, animal souls, especially the high level animals and human souls. So even the higher animals even have particular phronesis. But more importantly, when we get to the human, there seems to be a dominion within dominion, which of course for Spinoza would be anathema. In other words, there's a certain kind of civil, especially given the figures you're quoting, like Locke in particular, that it's an escape from nature. In other words, the in humans, the overcoming of nature is an escape from nature, which is to say, it is not just a domination of nature, but you have a state of nature and the state of society, which is, for Spinoza, that is anathema. There's no dominion within dominion. There's a natural state, but not a state of nature. And it's very interesting that Spinoza, who is figuring the same time, is, seems to be missing that completely, as, the, as is a really materialist Aristotle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I completely agree with Aristotle. Even in some moments of, of his Histoire uh, Naturelle, he he just mentioned. Uh, I only I, I only didn't find any any mention to Spinoza because he's referring many many authors, no, especially in the Varietes de l'Espèce, it's, it's full of quotes, mm -hmm. uh, even in, in the Histoire Naturelle in some parts, not in all. Uh, but. Is, is, well, is my only comment. I, I, I agree with Aristotle. I'm not sure if he has really a good idea about Spinoza or, or how are the relationship between Buffon and Spinoza directly. I mean, I don't know if he directly read it or not. Honestly, I have no idea. So I know if you know, tell me because I don't know. Yeah, no, but it's also the fact of his Aristotle is, if he's got a reference to Aristotle, it is a baptized one because for Aristotle, I mean, for Aristotle, there is the difference between humans and animals is really a matter of a, a degree, not kind. Mm -hmm. It's strictly a matter of degree. Of, like, and I love the end of the, the animal where there is no desire, there is paralysis. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is no escape from nature. Okay. Humans are nature. Exactly. Okay. It's only once we get to lock, in other words, much later on that we get a certain kind of dualism that you don't have in Aristotle until Aristotle is baptized. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know, great to know. Thank you. No, I can give you Aristotle yeah, yeah. A, a, a chapter and verse in line number in that sense, especially on the Dianima and the Dianima in relation to the Nicomachean ethics. And it's the form in which it is a predecessor to Spinoza, provided don't baptize. <laughs> we don't baptize Aristotle. Mm -hmm. And even the idea of the climate, no? I mean, uh, the, the importance of climate to determine human beings. Uh, one of, of many scholars who, who take up this idea was Aristotle, no? In, in uh, Thomas Aquinas and... and uh, uh, Thomas is already... In, in the Regimene, no? In the Regimene yeah. Principium. He, he says yeah, some yeah, words. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know, but Thomas is already straddling a really funny line, and he, he's aware of it himself in terms of, especially in the Contra Veroistas, because really the issue of Aristotle is, is a very sensitive one at that time. And what's very funny is in, um, on the, the anima in particular, when Aristotle is speaking about the material intellect, mm -hmm. it takes Aristotle to task that it's not it's not a passive intellect, it's not a material, it's not a highly, but it is possible, which is to say it already has a determination. In that sense, he already has to baptize Aristotle's the anima in order to allow it at all. Even then it's condemned later on. But mm -hmm. the interesting thing is even in the Contra Veroistas, he, uh, he says on the issue of individual immortality, <laughs> he's, he's in the Contra Veroistas, but he says, philosophically, it doesn't matter. We affirm it on the basis of faith. We don't disagree about, about triangles. We disagree about normative categories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and the, anyway. And there is other author, just, 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 but I remember the name is, his, his work is, like, was a physicist. His work was on earth, waters, and, and, and I don't know if someone reminds the, the, the name of this uh, physicist classic uh, after Aristotle. Uh, who was working and, and one of his ideas was, was the, the influence of climate on human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I don't remember right now, 
probably mm -hmm. not. Okay. Yeah, but it would not be Alexander. It wouldn't be in the school of Alexander and Themistius, that I can assure you. I mean, their material is through and through. Uh, it would probably be more likely in the Philopenus, again, going in a certain kind of Christian direction. Uh, yeah, this is true. It's again, it's a very different Aristotle. We, uh, our Aristotle is already very baptized. I mean, thoroughly. Yeah, yeah. There's a, the Christian uh, Aristotle. You know? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's, a, it's, it's the Aristotle of Judea Christianity, which is Christian. <laughs> but thank you very much. It was really interesting and very informative. Oh, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, we have Andrew still in the queue. Yeah, so before this, um, the only Buffon I had really been acquainted with was the, the football player, the soccer player. <laughs> so to see someone go in depth with um, Buffon race was very interesting. Um, and I, I was picking up what Jason mentioned about Hegel's references to Buffon. Um, and I want to talk a bit about and ask you if you see some of the same parallels between what Hegel was doing and what Buffon was doing. because. Um, I guess I'll try to keep it brief just to hear more of what you say than me rambling on about Hegel. But um, I took Jason's question and Edith's follow up about like a kingdom in a kingdom to be this Spinoza's worry that I agree with. And I'm seeing it in Buffon, but also in Hegel with the nature spirit distinction. Um, so part of why Hegel thought that like Africans were stuck in childishness, like in the start of the philosophy of history was because they hadn't transcended nature, right? There was no crossover into the realm of like Geist, basically. Um, and it seems like, to me at least, um, Buffon is making some of the same kind of points about Americans, um, that they had yet to dominate nature and the condition sine qua non, as you mentioned for that, was to, um, or for being a civilized, was to dominate nature. And thereby uh, reinscribing this kind of same hierarchical view that we see repeated over and over again. Um, and even with his monogenetic view of like the origin of humankind, uh, we see that he still ends up reinscribing the same kind of domination. Um, and also, I had one more thing, um, if I can remember it, just a moment. But okay, the other part is the the ignorance part where he, uh, Buffon knew about all the kind of native uh, language distinctions that like essence, person, person, humankind, et cetera, that existed, um, but yet he had ignored those in how he casted Americans as savages. Um, we see something similar in Hegel with the Haitian revolution. How he, he pretty much ignores completely the Haitian revolution, though he knew about it. There was a newspaper, I, I just can't, I can't remember the title now, maybe someone could help me, but where Hegel, you know, knows about the Haitian Revolution as it's happening, but refuses to talk about it in terms of nation building, in African nation building. Um, but, and then he does end up mentioning Haiti later, uh, but right, he ends up reinscribing the same hierarchy. He says that Haiti only became free with the influence of Christianity and white people. So I guess my, there's not really a question there, but I'm asking you to see if you see some of the same parallels between Hegel and Buffon on that, um, ignoring the role of race or ignoring the role of um, distinctions that raced people make and in um, casting this kind of nature sphere distinction or kingdom within a kingdom. So, but I really like the talk, so thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, well, first of all, yeah, I think for me, it's, it's interesting to see the, the chain, not the big chain, how how one philosopher follow the other and share some some tenets and disagree with others, of course. Uh, in the case of Buffon, I think it's a, it's a it's a very uh, important author during the 18th century. One can say, yeah, before some centuries before some some other philosophers said, said something different. Okay, that's true. I mean, some something similar. Sorry, yeah, of course it's true. But during the 18th century, I think. Uh, uh, Buffon was some kind of cornerstone, you know, and, and influenced many other philosophers. Uh, I, I have, for, for instance, a list of, of how many philosophers quote Buffon once or, or many times. And it, just, just to, to share it, it's 
The first is the a Swedish traveler, Peter Kalm. His work, well, ends Reza till North America, or translated as Travels into North America. Um, Oliver Goldsmith, the Irish novelist. Abby Renal, in his Istruffel in Philosophique du, de Du Indies. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Claude, de Lille de Salle, de la Philosophie de la Nature. Antoine Orno, Anecdotes American. William Robertson, History of America. Uh, William Guthrie, a new geographical, historical, and commercial grammar. Kant, for instance, no? Uh, Mention Cundio, the Philosophische Anthropologie, Reflexion in Sua Anthropologie. Uh, Julian Joseph Biré, La Histoire Naturelle du Gène Humain. Jean Baptiste Lamarck, Histoire Naturelle. Uh, of course, Hegel, no? I mean, there is a chain that, that finally arrives to Hegel, and, and, and probably, I don't know, and, and is far from, from Buffon. But I don't know, Gobi, no. Could be, I mean, just a consequence, far consequence from some tenets. I mean, so my what I'm interested in is to see this this chain of, of knowledge of, of ideas about some specific people in this case uh, Native Americans, uh, and see the connection between them. And and there, I will say there is similarities because uh, Hegel probably in seven in 1830s was writing something influenced by Buffon. To, to, to some or uh, uh, less or, or, or more, but surely influenced by Buffon. Because after that, Buffon was, Buffon was the Pog. And the Pog was my second, the second part of my presentation. And the Pog was in the German uh, linguistic, more, more close to the German area. And, and, and Kant called Buffon. Uh, sorry, but Kant, cons, Kant called Buffon and Kant called uh, the Pog, no? Cornelius de Pog. As a, as a great uh, human who knows about uh, America, for instance. So, and this idea was influenced by, by Kant and then uh, Hegel and so on. So, and, and the second part is, well, was astonished for me when he quote uh, both Buffon and the Pau, quote, for instance, uh, Sagun was a Spanish chronicler during the 16th century, some kind of anthropologist, and he refers to these ideas, these linguistic ideas, these, these concepts, you know, and are, are in, in, the, in his book. And that's why, why I was astonished why they know these works, Sagun, Acosta, and many others, and why, it, and it, I, I cannot really explain, because I don't know, why they decide to, to, to have just one, uh, pro, one idea of, of them and not consider all the information that they had access in some of the moment. You know? they, they decide in some moment, this, I accept this information, I, I regret this information. Based on what? And, and, and it's not very scientific in some moments. You know? But, but this is what, this is a, a scientific, scientific approach during the 18th century. We can say now, how come? His explanation is, is like a fantasy. Yeah, but now, but during the 18th century, during the 1749, the people who received his, his work, his Histoire Naturelle, was were a, with more expectation about a, a really good, you know, scientific work with some tenets, and that tenets had some consequences, you know? And, and now I was talking specifically about the, the uh, indigenous Americans, but many other uh, communities of population, you know? So I will say, yeah, why he doesn't, he didn't quote these concepts, for instance, I don't know, it's a good question. And the other influence Hegel, yeah, to some extent, yeah, sure. And some of the Hegelian tenets are Buffonian tenets in, to some extent, yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you, that helps. Uh, we have Jason again. I just wanted to supplement what, what Andrew was saying and what Alberto was saying in response, because for me, it was so interesting to get this background from you, Alberto. I just put this pair of passages in the chat because uh, it seems like so many of these ridiculous prejudices in Hegel that are also in Kant, that are also in these figures like down this chain, it seems like so many of these prejudices are, are maybe beginning with Buffon. I mean, even some of the more ridiculous and silly things, such as that lions 
in America would be smaller. Uh, uh, that's this is from Hegel uh, uh, the uh, lectures on um, philosophy of history, uh, but also uh, the idea that indigenous Americans are um, without higher thought. Uh, this is coming apparently down the line as well. And I feel like it's it's interesting to mention um, alongside what, what Andrew notes, because um, I feel like relatively often we have with, with Hegel, the discussion of the African continent and, and reference uh, to the ridiculousness of, of those passages, which have been influential, yeah. But, but less often we have the contrast that Hegel draws between then the, the peoples of the African continent and then the indigenous Americans who he says are even less capable of, of culture than uh, Africans who are then brought to uh, America or the Americas uh, uh, to make up for the fact that indigenous Americans are so incapable. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to, to add these ridiculous passages uh, from from Hegel, which seem like they they echo so strongly a couple of the points that that are maybe originating with Buffon. I mean, it's really helpful to see the lineage to to know better the genealogy of some of this prejudice. Yeah. And then I had another question earlier, but I don't want to jump ahead. Uh, Emanuele, can I can I try to reformulate my question from the second question I had from earlier? Please. Okay. Uh, so so my thing. Unless someone else has, uh, someone who hasn't spoken yet has, uh... go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, no, my, my second question from earlier, which I think got caught in, in the um, internet connectivity issues was that I was interested in echoes of this notion of mastering the climate today. So, um, you know, one response to climate crisis is, okay, we should dominate nature to an even greater degree uh, and develop new technologies to capture carbon and uh, so on and so forth. I mean, it seems like some of this mastery of nature and specifically climate in, in Buffon is anticipating this style of, of thinking. Uh, I mean, it's a very difficult question to, to throw at you now, but I'm just wondering if you also see some of these connections if, if you think there are any lessons to be learned from Buffon here. Uh, 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 if there's more you could tell us maybe about what Buffon has to say about mastering uh, nature insofar as it's iterated as the climate. Uh, uh, I mean, does that like what does that mean for him? Does that mean, you know, managing agriculture or, or what actually does that spell out? into uh, any, anything on this front. I'd be, I'd be really interested to, to learn more. Yeah, you know, uh, about the mastery nature. Yeah, for him was, was definitely was something important. And, and the difference between uh, civilized human and not civilized human was how they, they, they dominate nature, how they change it, you know, change it for their own benefit. And well, another, one of the reasons that, that Americans, so not only Americans, but both indigenous Americans were inferior was that they live uh, a different way of life, you know, more in contact with nature. And for him was, well, this is, this shouldn't be. I mean, civilized people transform nature according to their own necessities. But it's funny because for him, in this determining idea that, that uh, you know, from, from a broad perspective, for Buffon, the, 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 the earth was living uh, a, a, a process of a living a process of of, of cooling. You know? His idea was after in I don't know how many thousands of years, we, we will live in a in a cold planet. The air was living was Pass, you know, from from an incandescent willow, and it's a large process. At, at the end, the air will be just cold, and that's all. And, and, and there will be no life in, on the earth. You know? So, so considering this determinist idea, this necessary process, probably for him was okay. Now is our time, and we need to, uh, you know, take something good from the nature. 
because it's inevitable that in future, the earth as a natural process is, is becoming uh, freezing, is, is freezing, is freezing, freeze, and, and after that, it's, a, it's a, a cooling and cooling and cooling. And after that will be just, as I said, a, a cold planet. So, so is the so, cooling phase A? I think you said humanity was phase seven, right? Yeah. You know, for him, okay. the natural process of the planet passed yeah. from, from the, the incandescent uh, earth to a, a natural process of, of, uh, of, of cooling. In some moment of the, of the history of the earth, we are, we are like we are now, we can live on earth because it's not enough uh, cool. Mm -hmm. But after, I don't know, some thousand of years, the life will be impossible on earth and, and nature and trees and human beings and all evil beings will die you know, naturally. So considering this, this idea, this general idea of, of the history of earth, probably he assumed that, yeah, okay, we, we need to dominate nature, and this is part of our natural process. And in future, it doesn't matter because the nature has a determining end, you know? the earth as a planet. You know? and, and, and according to his calculation, this, this, this will, it is impossible to change. Even, even the, 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 human, the human hand, uh, humans cannot change this, this uh, determinist way of, 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 of the earth. You know? So yeah, I mean, we can uh, see in Buffon, like in many other authors, our process of how we explode nature. And we, in some, some extent, we're living a consequence of this uh, idea of this uh, approach to nature uh, that is not Buffonian, but Buffon is an important part of, of this, of course. It is what I can say now. Okay, so uh, we have three minutes left. I will exploit them if you allow me. Uh, first, I wanted to ask a very quick thing that you might answer in a, in a second, which is, uh, would you find Spinoza in Dupa uh, rather than in Buffon? Because, you know, being Dutch, he might have had some more direct channels uh, to, to Spinoza. Um, so that's, a very, very quick uh, thing. The second is, um, I'm very curious about this idea um, of development of uh, epochs, as you call, as he calls them. Um, and I was thinking, uh, from a teleological point of view, is the human domination, human mastery, human exploitation uh, considered to be beneficial to nature? Uh, is it kind of a nobilitation? Uh, is it making nature better? Or is it not? Or is it, a, you know, uh, a kind of antagonistic uh, solution, right? So is the seventh era uh, kind of an overcoming of the past ones? Or is it a good, you know, teleological, nat natural development? Uh, so is there a brackage there or is it a continuity? Uh, and so should nature, let's say, be happy uh, about being mastered? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the last question, yeah. I mean, the, the exploitation or, or the domination and mastering of nature is part of a natural process for him. Mm -hmm. you know? So is is probably Buffon never, never asked or never questioned himself, like, this is good or bad? It's just a normal process. It's a natural mm -hmm. process, and it's how it, it should be. That's all. And and first, uh, well, I, I my my idea was connect Buffon and the Pau because the Pau uh, quote many times Buffon and was their most important influence among many others, many travelers and and and, uh, and well, other scholars of, of his time. So that's 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 the reason. And then the Pau influence can't particularly Kant, probably Herder, and even uh, Hegel. So that, that's a, that, that my idea to, to connect to, uh, to um, I, I forgot the, the word, sorry, to, you know, Buffon, the Paul, like two different uh, 
context to different linguistic uh, areas or spheres, but they follow the same idea that comes during the 18th century, I mean, from Buffon as the masterpiece, as the master who, who, this, who developed the most important ideas. No? Absolutely. Uh, and one last quick historical note. Uh, part of the evidence that might have led him to believe that the earth is cooling is that they had a micro ice age uh, in the second half of the 18th century that actually led to, according to some people, to the French Revolution. Uh, so he might just have been looking at records of temperatures across the globe and it was like, oh, we're cooling. Um, but uh, so all that aside, uh, please join me in thanking Alberto once more. For yeah, let me, very, let oh, me oh. start. Let me have a funny moment. This reminds me a little bit of Isidore of Seville. Uh, yes. Like we're talking sixth, seventh century, who in his annal has a fantastic explanation about the natives of Africa being so adapted that in the middle, because it's so hot, in the middle of the hot day, they can put their leg up and their feet are so large that it can be an umbrella. <laughs> Uh, Edith, you went mute. It's the last part. Yeah. It, just, it, just still on mute. <laughs> my cat decided to mute me. But what's especially funny, I mean, about what is presented here as science, there's so much, there's also the fiction here is fantastic. And it makes me think, I mean, Isadore of Seville is sixth century. <laughs> sixth yeah. century. But it really is, it's sort of brought to mind, like, Sizes of flies, etc. I mean, and the fact that we even find it later in Hegel, it's just to say the least fantastic, but fantastic in a horrifying way. Yeah. So in Isidore, it's not horrifying in the same way. When we find it by the time we get to the 18th century, in the 19th century, there's something quite horrifying about it. Uh, by the time we get to Hegel, it's phrenology, like it's skull yeah. measure, stuff like yeah. that. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So thank you so very, very much. Oh, thank you for, for joining and be here. And yeah. uh, we will see you once again in two weeks for our final feature of um, the semester before our day-long workshop on Spinoza that is uh, in May. So thanks, everybody, and I will see you soon. Thank you. Bye. I will see you on Friday. Take care. Thank you.